everyone. Uh, I am Ruchi Anand uh, from IIT Bombay. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, extra crystallography. Um, and this is a part of a refresher course, which I was requested to give. So let me start my lecture. Uh, without further ado, I thank everyone for inviting me, uh, especially um, the organizers, for being letting me part of this course. So let me uh, share my uh, uh, my screen with you, uh, and uh, I'm going to start my lecture. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, X-ray crystallography, uh, which is considered photography at an atomic level. And here, what you can see uh, that I'm showing you uh, is uh, uh, are some beautiful looking crystals, uh, which uh, uh, which are uh, uh, which are of uh, many of them are protein crystals. And uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, uh, how protein crystals are so important for uh, the field of crystallography uh, and to understand protein structure. Uh, and here, um, the first time uh, uh, the structure of any uh, biological molecule was determined uh, was that of the DNA. And now you can all know that uh, it's a double helix. And it was via the work of Watson and Crick, this uh, amazing discovery happened. And uh, in, in their words only, that it is the structure, as they quote it, uh, which describes um, how a molecule uh, looks like. And without knowing the structure, uh, one will not be able to tell about this function. So the double helix was the first uh, uh, path-breaking structure in biological sciences. Uh, and uh, actually, it was a, it was a mixture of bio biology and chemistry coming together. And uh, uh, that had provided us uh, so much information about how DNA wraps and uh, what DNA looks like. Uh, so um, uh, that was done by X-ray crystallography. And uh, over the years, uh, way before the structure of the um, of the double helix, a lot of development happened in the field of, of uh, crystallography. So there are more than 30 Nobel Prizes in this field. Generally, you know, you have a field, maybe one or two go, but crystallography is such a field where in the early days, the physicists got it for being able to understand how crystals can be used to determine uh, structure. And then later on, it, uh, it was became an endeavor with the chemists where uh, more complicated uh, structures uh, and uh, so on were determined. And now in the recent uh, years, a lot of biological crystallography is going on and a lot of uh, structure of uh, proteins, protein with DNA complexes, how do uh, the basic protein production machinery work, works, which is the ribosome. Uh, then there is the uh, RNA, uh, RNA copying mechanism, which is RNA polymerase. Roger Kornberg determined it, uh, you can see in 2006. So, and the how to potassium channels, as the picture shows here, how does one get uh, the sodium potassium balance in our body through structures? People were able to tell and many of the stories. Lord McCannon uh, in 2003 became famous for his potassium channel structure. So, a lot of this information uh, came from just knowing uh, the structure of the. Uh, uh, of the uh, molecule in, in action. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I, you can see here 1901, Ron Chen discovered the x-rays and this is the picture of her wife with a hand with the uh, with this uh, finger and you already know how, how important x-rays are for uh, you know, uh, determining whether you have a broken limb or not, and it's there used every day. So that was the first time the power of x-rays had come along. And till date, we are, we are seeing the um, importance of uh, x-ray in science as well. So like I was telling you, the DNA was the first structure Watson and Crick determined it with the help of Rosalind Franklin actually. And they got uh, this kind of a pattern. Uh, and so you don't see the molecule. There is a, uh, you, you will see uh, something called a diffraction pattern. And because this is like a fiber, you kind of get spots. And in case of DNA, you get X-shaped spots. And it was Rosalind Franklin who first uh, recorded this uh, image. And from there, uh, people were able to tell the structure and uh, the double helix structure and how the base uh, bases interact with one another, the purine and the pyrimidine bases. So uh, uh, similarly, uh, another lady, I'm just mentioning uh, ladies, although Peter Kendrew also did a lot of work in being able to solve the structure of myoglobin, uh, was uh, Dorothy Hodgkins. And she said, solved the structure of this 
complicated molecule called vitamin B12 and you know vitamin B is so important and she was able to tell what it looks like and also this very amazing lady saw the structure of insulin so if you know what insulin is I don't even have to tell you insulin is very important uh, molecule uh, in, in diabetes you uh, you must have heard you have to take insulin to get your sugar levels uh, right so again crystals of insulin which is a protein was determined uh, by uh, Dorothy Hodgkins and uh, that led to uh, this particular discovery uh, of the structure and I already mentioned to you uh, bacterial ribosome, which is where, uh, which helps, it's a complicated machinery, which helps in the uh, structure uh, of the machine, which makes proteins. So it, uh, it was determined by three scientists, Venki, Ramakrishnan, Tom Stites, and Adam Rivard. So that was one of the structures in 2009 uh, by X-ray crystallography, which was a mega, mega protein structure, which was determined. So, um, uh, these contributions of crystallography has made it so important. So what is doing protein crystallography or crystallography at the atomic level? So when uh, you want to get the picture of anything, your picture, for example, you would go in front of the mirror and uh, you would uh, look at yourself uh, and uh, you will see your beautiful picture. But for this, you need light. If I were to turn off all lights, you will not be able to do this. So light is interacting with our body in some way or scattering it, let's put it, and the mirror is putting it all back together and we are able to get a picture. That's what is happening. So we can see ourselves, we can see many objects, but we cannot see individual atoms and bones. For that, you need to go into diffraction space. So there are no mirrors which exist like this that will be able to take a molecule and just present it as a mirror image. Okay, so these uh, kind of mirrors do not uh, exist. Rather, uh, in uh, many times, uh, chiral molecules, they are not even identical. So why we can't do it? The problem is the wavelength. So we can, at a particular wavelength, we can only distinguish whatever that wavelength allows us to distinguish. So the, that means we have to find something that can project an image or the scattering that occurs due to the light can put it back together a lens at atomic wavelength which is around 1.4 Armstrongs. So you can take a camera and you can zoom, zoom, zoom in but you will never reach that wavelength. This problem of wavelength will not be solved by visible light which is not in that region. What you need is a wavelength which is in this region as you can see and in this subatomic which is around between 0.5 and 1.5 Armstrong, there are no mirrors that exist. No light can be put together or focused. And that is why uh, the problem exists. So uh, the problem we have is we need the light, which is the same wavelength as what we are trying to probe. So if you want to look at a large object, we can look at large objects. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, you can look in the visible region. You can look at large objects here. Um, uh, that we see all the time, but we cannot see even if we peer a lot atomic level. So for that, whatever wavelength you want to see, that is the uh, uh, distance between atoms, uh, the same wavelength you have to see, the right scale is required. So X-ray, first of all, utilizing X-ray radiation by diffraction experiments. So like I have mentioned, Don Chen was the first guy and he was able to make X-rays by uh, uh, by uh, uh, taking uh, a voltage between uh, uh, between a cathode and an anode and then was able to uh, eject the electrons which went to the anode and as a result of uh, reaching the anode the uh, inertial electrons were, uh, uh, were kind of taken out uh, and uh, when they were put back in the x-rays were produced so uh, so Ron Chen first showed how X-rays work. Now, because there are these fixed levels at which the X-rays work, you will get fixed levels at which X-rays are produced. And this is just showing an example of copper, where uh, uh, is a very commonly used uh, uh, used uh, um, uh, anode uh, that uh, is there. So this is the energy. Uh, and you can see K alpha 2, alpha 1, beta, it is the levels from which and you can see alpha 1, alpha 2 and that is where uh, and this beta 1 uh, is shown and that is uh, uh, what you see as these spikes over here. 
so depending on which energy level uh, the uh, the uh, the electrons are coming down to you will have extras produced uh, uh, and that uh, that particular difference is what you see as what this will show in the lab uh, this is complicated looking but this is what we use uh, uh, for uh, being able to collect data so this black thing here is called a detector for, uh, where the scattering is recorded and here uh, where i'm looking here which is called rotating anode this is where the x-rays are being produced and as the x-rays are produced uh, they actually hit the crystal which is here and uh, this is cooling system so that the crystal uh, uh, does not get uh, melted because of the x-rays and uh, then the uh, recording happens and uh, this this video microscope is to visualize the crystal that you have put it properly and you rotate your crystals to this kappa omega and two theta and you collect many many x-ray scattering uh, uh, pictures from which you can get the structure so this is what a typical diffractometer looks like in nowadays uh, people do not uh, only collect data in the diffractometer because protein uh, crystals are weakly diffracting and i'll tell you why a little later uh, they also go to these large ring shaped structures called the synchrotron and here the electrons are accelerated at a very high speed and as they turn uh, because of the circular structure uh, they produce x-rays of all wavelengths so you don't have to have a fixed wavelength you can uh, pretty much select the wavelength you want and also the flux that is uh, in some way you can say intensity of the uh, wavelength that you're using will be very high in synthesis so many of the uh, protein structures that are determined like the ribosome have been done at a synchrotron radiation and this is the one uh, advanced photon source in USA this picture I am showing you and then uh, there is where you go and collect your data so for structure determination you first need crystals so what the uh, methods that you use is you uh, use something called a hanging drop where you are able to make crystals uh, and these crystals are then sh shot on the x-ray and from the x-ray you get something these dots which are the diffraction pattern and from the diffraction pattern you are able to use a computer not a lens to come up with a structure okay so that is the workflow for structure determination the first question that would arise at this point is why would you need even any crystals why can't you just uh, use a single molecule and uh, shine it with light and be done with so what happens is that generally it is not easy to do that uh, because the each molecule is very small so the diffraction uh, that comes from that molecule is very small hence what people do is they grow crystals which act like a amplifier and so in general this is many 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 molecules arranged in a perfect pattern which are there so you have it in some kind of crystal lattice and there are and this motif is our uh, protein molecule and it's arranged and packed in an orderly fashion and every molecule the diffraction from it acts like a an amplifier and as a result you are able to see enough signal to form the structure so crystals of small molecules this is metallic crystals look like this and they are very hard and this is sodium chloride type small molecule crystals like look like this Uh, but when you come to protein crystals, these are crystals of a virus. Actually, you can crystallize viruses also. They look actually very pretty, like you can call diamonds, and you can have different shapes uh, of them that they can crystallize them. So, uh, so, uh, uh, and they have a lot of water in it, as opposed to metal, metallic or sodium chloride crystals, which are very hard as compared to these crystals, which are very soft and have a lot of water channels. So. the concept of crystallography whether it's small molecule or large molecule remains the same everything has to pack uh, whether it is uh, lithium chloride here which is being packed in a primitive uh, structure or uh, it can be set cubic centered with a molecule in the center and on the sides and it could be face centered where all faces have it or it can be hexagonal and then they pack into infinite such you can call boxes and you are able to get a crystal structure so whether it is lithium chloride protein or uh, rna dna whatever they will all come together in these kinds of arrangements which can be for small molecule large molecule for any crystal for that matter so and uh, the uh, in crystallography uh, the uh, the whole thing is divided into something called bravais lattice 
uh, and they are protein peripheral lactase. And you can see the way the labeling is done is if there's nothing in the center, it's called primitive. If there's something in the body center, it is called I. If it is space center, it's called F. And then, depending on whether it is tetragonal, uh, if uh, all angles are 90, one side is equal, orthorhombic, where no, no of the sides are equal, of the, uh, is this cube, but all angles are 90. And you can have monoclinic, where nothing is, uh, uh, no sides are equal, but two angles are 90, and so on. You can have many, many such uh, arrangements uh, uh, that have been described over here that you can use for uh, describing your crystal type. And this will help you in determining the symmetry of the crystal, which is very important because symmetry of the crystal is reflected in the diffraction pattern. So when you have a, a structure that needs to be determined, you will have you will shine light on it and you will see these uh, diffraction patterns which are in the form of dots and uh, an equation is ascribed to it. I will only tell you a little bit about this equation here uh, because these dots are intensities which are reflected in something called structure factor and then there is something called a phase which is very important so structure factor and phase put together when you are able to solve this equation you are able to get something called electron density because you are scattering electrons and as a result you get a map from which you can build like a puzzle the protein structure so what you get out of uh, extra diffraction when you put it uh, uh, FT means Fourier transform. So all scattering space is called in the Fourier space. Uh, when you transform it, you get rho R, which is electron density, which is nothing but telling where electrons are. Wherever there are more electrons, you will see more density. Where there are less electrons, you will see less density. And electromagnetic uh, 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 radiation, uh, uh, as we know it um, uh, in various wavelengths, like we have uh, said, uh, goes from various wavelengths, but what essentially it looks like is there is an electric vector and there is a magnetic vector which is uh, perpendicular to it. And it is with the electric vector that all electrons they uh, interact, uh, and other and uh, uh, we are able to because of the interaction of the electric vector, we are able to get the diffraction. But the direction of propagation of wave, wave is called S0 here is given like this, perpendicular to both of them. Okay, and so this is a wave with uh, 180 degree, 360 degree, as you can see, and this is uh, the lambda of the wave. So this is why it's called an electromagnetic wave. So all that we work with uh, uh, in whether they are X-rays or uh, visible light or microwaves are all electromagnetic waves. So Coming back uh, to our experiment, like we, I said before, we don't have a lens which will focus uh, this. If you remember in high school physics, you must have done uh, something where you have an object and you put a lens and uh, 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 through the lens, you can get an inverted image, convex, concave lenses putting together uh, and you are able to make these images. But we don't have any lens. So as a result, we use uh, the scattering uh, of the light, no lens to kind of put it back once it is scattered. And we collect the scattering itself and use the computer as a lens for image reconstruction. So let's uh, look at what diffraction is now. I Most of you must have studied diffraction at some point, And you remember the double slit experiment, which is a very famous uh, experiment which they do in physics, where they say that uh, you get light to enter uh, uh, these are parallel waves. Uh, uh, through a double slit and you will see that two wave fronts will be developed and you will see constructive and destructive, constructive, destructive interference. So every time two waves are uh, a multi multiple of each other away, that means they're, uh, they're, uh, you can see their, uh, uh, their intensities are matching, you will see uh, uh, constructive uh, interference. And if uh, uh, the, the high intensity and the uh, low intensity of the other matches, then you will see destructive interference, which is darkness denoted by here. So same thing is happening. Uh, you are used to only doing the double slit, but in crystallography or any diffraction, you are going to have multiple slits because there will be many, many, many such electrons and each of them will work as slits. And you will be uh, having uh, this particular uh, diffraction. Uh, so if you look at this uh, formula, uh, for uh, uh, multiple slits, what is happening is uh, the formula that you get, I'll go back, will be 
what is the difference in the path length over here, which can be calculated by sine theta equal to x uh, by uh, by d. So d is here, and um, uh, it is it is perpendicular by hypotenuse, and this is theta, and this is the extra path. Uh, with respect to this one, if you look, this is x is the extra path that has been uh, uh, the wave has traveled, and uh, that uh, is equal to uh, uh, n lambda uh, d sine theta, which we have come from here. So this is the formula which uh, has been used uh, for diffraction, and uh, mm, from a slit. And here uh, the slit is being shown. If it's a circular slit, uh, earlier we were showing only one dimension. You will see something like this instead of seeing what you saw before. There will be uh, concentric circles of uh, high and low intensity. Okay, and in in one D it looks like this, but in uh, when you when you actually uh, uh, go in three D it will look like this. So uh, again, uh, I have uh, told you when uh, they are uh, two pi, then the waves will kind of uh, uh, superimpose on one another. But when they are uh, Pi shifted from another like this wave. Uh, when this is rising, this is going in the opposite direction, so they will cancel out each other. Okay, so uh, cancellation of waves will happen in this case, and you will get nothing because uh, they, their phases are actually not aligned. And when you add such waves, uh, you will get uh, answers uh, 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 and intensity based on uh, each one of them. So you, if you remember, I said. Uh, F is the intensity, uh, represents the intensity, and then uh, where they are located uh, uh, represents the phase. This 2 pi, pi are, is uh, considered as the phase of each one of them. Okay. So uh, each of these waves are differently uh, uh, placed where they're, uh, uh, they're uh, when you add them, you will get something which will be something like this. So scattering from a visible light, I've already shown with one pinhole. But if you have two pinholes, this is how the pattern becomes. You can see there's a center of symmetry in the pattern and light goes through it. Now uh, you can see uh, this uh, uh, center of symmetry in both directions that is there. Now you tilt the pinhole and the pattern will also tilt. And again, you will have this tilting of the pattern that you can see in one direction or in the other direction. The pattern will tilt accordingly and you will but have a center of symmetry still remaining. You can have four such uh, uh, pinholes, and you can see again diffraction pattern, which looks like this, and so on. Uh, and you will see that all there a center of symmetry will always be there in these kind of patterns. So, in this uh, uh, way, if I keep on doing this, you will be able to see the patterns can be rotated, and you will still have center of symmetry, and you will get these patterns which are there uh, as you have the pinholes uh, number change. So you are actually making a pattern with big holes, uh, uh, and uh, if you destroy symmetry, you will have different patterns. So let me show you one pinhole. You have this two pinholes perpendicular. You have this. You rotate the pinholes. The pattern rotates. You rotate in another way. The pattern again rotates, and you can have three pinholes. Uh, 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 and if you destroy the symmetry, the symmetry here will be slightly destroyed. And you can see here something which a pinhole which looks like a benzene will give you something like this, which is very highly symmetrical. So you, uh, so you can see if a molecule was arranged like a, instead of, if this is a pinhole where light is going through, but if suppose electrons were there instead, where carbon atoms are there, so in that case you would see something in an X-ray like this. Okay, that is a transform of a molecule. So in this way, suppose I take you this, give you this some um, scattering and you say, what is this? It's Mickey Mouse actually. So the scattering of Mickey Mouse doesn't look like Mickey Mouse at all. You can see that. And again, if I take and only take the center of this, then I will see Mickey Mouse, but its features are gone. It's not that great. But if I take the outside part, part of the Mickey Mouse, which is a data, which is X-ray data, which is something called high resolution data, you will see a thin outline of the Mickey Mouse. I will not know how fat it is, but I will be able to see the features pretty clearly. So what it is telling you is in this high resolution data, the fine features are there. And if you lose it, you will not be able to see the Mickey Mouse uh, with its fine features. And uh, uh, similarly, same thing happens. Uh, instead of Mickey Mouse, if you take a molecule, you will see that as you cut the data, here it is cut, and here it is full, you will be get, a, get a better image of the molecule when you have taken much more of the data. 
Okay, so uh, in a diffraction pattern, because there are many, many molecules are there, the lattice and the molecule convolution is there, and ultimately you will be able to get the protein structure of this palatocyanin by using these dots. So, uh, uh, how this uh, uh, repeating pattern develops? Suppose I were to repeat pinholes in this direction, you see, I will see some streaks in the perpendicular direction. But when you, I have uh, uh, pinholes in all directions, I see this pattern forming. So I can show you this one direction, two direction, and uh, you can see the streakiness, and then it becomes dots. This is what we uh, actually collect with protein structures. So uh, you will be able to know uh, what this uh, 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 represent. So all optical transforms have a center of inversion. Uh, at the end, you will know if the object is a mirror plane, then the optical transform will also have a mirror plane. If the object is rotated, uh, the optical transform, which is the diffraction pattern in this case, will also uh, 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 get rotated. And the optical transform and the object are inversely related. That is, there is related by Fourier transform. Okay. So now this is the optical transform uh, of uh, a molecule which looks like napthalene. And if I were to uh, calculate it, I will get something like this. So I know that this calculation is like naphthalene, but I'm thinking only a single naphthalene uh, or a benzene molecule let's shift. And as I make a crystal out of it, you see what happens, the dot starts appearing. So let me go back. There the streaky pattern is there uh, uh, as I'm adding the benzenes. And then as I am going in 3D, the streakiness disappears and I get this pattern. And this is the pattern that I am used to actually observing. So in this part, we learned that light waves are in phase when they reach the pinhole mask. Each pinhole acts like a secondary wave and scatters it. The value of the optical transform in any given direction is sum of waves scattered from individual pinholes. And the scattered waves are generally out of phase except when the path difference is integral number of waves. The optical transform of a lattice of molecule is convolution of optical transform of molecule and optical transform of the lattice. Okay, so I'm going to end this uh, part of my lecture and I will come back for my next uh, uh, portion uh, after all. Bye. So let me uh, uh, stop sharing uh, uh, this screen and uh, go back to the presentation. Let me stop sharing. Uh, and uh, I'd like to stop recording at this point.